It is the Anfield wrap. After Liverpool uh, drew one all with Manchester City at Anfield in what was undoubtedly a great game, I've got Ian Ryan, Rob Gutman and Neil Jones. And this episode is sponsored by Green King Sport, where football is indeed more than a game, uh, which coincidentally is the way you could describe all events at Anfield yesterday, as far as I was concerned and my heart rate. Uh, the league season is entering the business end. You don't have to tell me that, Green King Sport. And the venues are showing every single televised Liverpool fixture over the running 900 sports pubs across the UK. It doesn't matter where you're based. You can get every single minute of the action. It is best enjoyed with friends or other humans, not least so you've got someone to absolutely melt down in front of. So if you're not at the game this month, get in your group chat, etc. Sort it out. Get to a local Green King Sports venue to catch the game. <laughs> uh, with the app, there's exclusive competitions and discounts whenever there is a game on. Uh, there was a game on at Anfield. Liverpool won, Manchester City won, Neil Jones. We do press conference extra. We talked it through. We talked about this game in the past. We talked about the manager. We talked about both managers. Um, it was a game of exceptional quality. I think it's one of the best football matches I've ever seen. Yeah, big build-up. Um, yeah, I, I mean, we we done the prediction or, or sort of what, how we thought it'd go on Friday on, on the show and I thought a lot of things might happen and I thought if Liverpool was to get a good result, I thought a lot of things had to happen and none of them happened. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought Liverpool would have to make it a really horrible game and a really sort of a, a bitty game and maybe score first and fly out the traps and all these things rely on the bench to, to, to maybe to maybe sort of make a massive difference and they didn't Liverpool just played you know outside the first 20 minutes played really well and actually bested City in, in the second half you look at the by some distance yeah I mean you look at the all the stats I mean I, I, th I think it's only the second time ever Liverpool have had more possession in a game against Guardiola's City um, I think the only other time was the one that they lost in 2019 in January yep. they had the XG in the second half was was much higher. The shots, the the Two, touches shots. in the box. Yep. I think it was thirty to eight or or around that that sort of um, number. And the eye test told you they were the more dangerous team. They were the ones that if you were you didn't care about the result, you were watching it and thinking, well, that team in red's going to win this. They're they're the ones who are going to get the goal. And I know City had a big moment at the end, and always carry that sort of residual fear that they have but for me I thought Liverpool I think Klopp said 53 minutes and he said it's the best 53 minutes we've ever produced against City I'm not sure but it's definitely up there The second half performance Ian is it's, it's got everything from Liverpool except the winner we will talk about the referee in a minute but it's got everything except the winner from a Liverpool point of view on the pitch <clears throat> off the pitch the whole feel of the thing, the level of defiance, the level of confidence, the level of belief, uh, the way everyone backed everyone up. Um, it was, for me, um, one of Liverpool's best performances in a massive game under this manager, and that is saying something. Yeah, when the um, when the teams break, you look at it and you think, no, this could be, this could be a tough afternoon. But if you'd have told me, come the end of the game, you'd have been disappointed with not winning it. I'd have been thinking... Wow, what have these boys got in store for us today? But what they had in store for us was one of the most gutsy performances I've seen in a long time, full of grit, full of determination, tons and tons of quality, players all over the park stepping up, and they roared on and backed by a ferocious crowd that gave them absolutely everything. And they gave us everything back, and that's all you can really ask for, to be honest. And it was it was some performance in that second half. And at the end, you're feeling maybe a little bit disheartened. Not in them, never in them. Very rarely in them under this manager, but in what unravels with the with the penalty, and you feel like you've been a little bit more than a little bit robbed. But honest to God, Neil, to a man, they all step up, and one or two have to find themselves. You know, Joe Gomez is a really tough first half where you think maybe this maybe this hasn't really worked in terms of playing him full back, left hand side. But again, he he galvanises, he finds himself, and lots of them do, and. I remember looking at the kind of clock on about nine minutes and thinking, Christ, I can't believe it's only nine minutes here. I was like, can we, can we just get the 25 here, boys? <laughs> this, I was on my knees for 25. The ball's got to play, doesn't it? That's yeah. the problem with them. This could, be, this could be really, really tough, but they dig in. And they've dug in so many times this season. And, you know, it's another one of them where massive credit to the manager, massive credit to the players. I did think the fans really, really stepped up. And it, it was a game where you don't need to be told what to do. But when it does go against you a little bit, maybe sometimes you can kind of, you know, you can feel a little bit sorry for yourself, but it didn't happen. And as I say, crowd, players, manager, every single one of them stood up yesterday. It was some second half performance. They show courage, Rob. The other thing they show, I think, as the game wears on, 
when they get the sea legs after the first 15, but it's part of that process, is they show an unbelievable amount of intelligence. Mm-hmm. They begin to work out where their areas are, where they can win it back, who they need to get at. They begin to anticipate where the next ball's going to go, where the runner's going to go, the options City are going to take, the one they can leave alone. And that grows and grows and grows and grows. And we've talked all season about how they seem coachable, great half-times, manager seems really, really attuned to them. It adds everything in terms of that. I thought that performance where they just, the, 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 on top of everything else, all the other qualities that Ian states, they're so intelligent, Liverpool, over the, as the game wears on. Yeah, they are. Um, it's a strange game. I mean, we, in a certain sense, when you face Man City compared to a normal game where you go, well, either we're going to be much better and therefore we're going to have to work out their low block or... I don't know, or well, maybe you're going to come under pressure at the Emirates and so you're going to, you're going to have to sit back yourselves. And there's, there's a different sort of ebb and flow. But it's, with City, it's, it's, too, it's too heavy where it's just going at each other, really, the whole time. So I think as much as you've got to, the brain has got to be used, well, I suppose your passing's got to be perfect. That's you, what I mean, you, yeah. You, you've yeah, got to make your decisions yeah. all got to be right. You can't, you can't try that ball unless you're going to get it right. The control, the, the, the touch has got to be perfect. And we, it was at every... We lift, We found the level we had to find. But the thing that wins football matches usually is being first to a football quicker than your opponent. I mean, and that's what... what It took their goal, I think, to turn that tide for us. I, I knew they'd... St- I wasn't worried by their fastish start because you knew damn well that's exactly what they had to do. If they achieved one thing that afternoon with Guardiola, said you cannot not start fast because otherwise that crowd will be at you from the word go and you'll find yourself 2-0 down on half an hour because Liverpool can do that if you give them a sniff. So you, what you're going to do is turn that entire thing around, quieten their crowd. I thought we'd weathered it at, at the point they'd scored um, and it felt a real kick in the pants to concede yeah. a goal like that to them. There's no... There's no two ways about it but I think we but we kept calm we weren't there were you know the, the the tsunami that Guardiola went on to describe as being in the second half for 20 minutes I, I saw it as more like what did Klopp say 53 minutes but we were we, we had chances in that first half I mean I watched back some of the the, the short highlights this morning you go you know, a, a little bit, a little bit uh, more luck and hesitation, and we, that goal from Diaz doesn't get ruled out. The Soboslai's header, we Brad, think. Bradley had a couple, didn't he? Really? Oh yeah, shoot the shot, really. Yeah, yeah. It whistles past the post. Somebody can't. Uh, Nunes couldn't quite get a touch off the side. I think so on the back post. And then, and then there's the first of of, of Diaz's big chance. There's a chance he makes for himself by sort of keeping the ball and skipping past two. And you just the, the goal is gaping for a player of your quality now, and he just drags it a bit. But you know what? Had we got it, had we got that goal before half time, I'd have thought we think we'd have all gone in at half time. We really deserved this. Now we're going to go on and win it. But there was a sense of, of fatalism, I think, because we didn't get it. Um, but then again, the second half happened. But you cannot underestimate what a Liverpool crowd does. But I think that was crowd and team in perfect uh, uh, symbiosis, really. The Arteta line, Rob, again, this which we've liked this season, put them in the washing machine. That yeah. genuinely really happened. See, Guardiola says tsunami. I know what he means by sort of saying it's just 20 minutes because they have sort of eight minutes where they rest some control back and look after the ball, City. But then it comes again. And that's yeah. again what doesn't happen in the game against Arsenal at Anfield. 45 to 70 against Arsenal were absolutely unbelievable. We just don't get the goal. Yeah. Um, and then Arsenal managed to reclaim some control, not as much as City had for that eight minute period, but they managed to see the rest of the game out with a level of calm. City have their eight minutes. And I think they think, oh, we're quiet in the crowd. It will be all right. And Liverpool just grab the ball back. And it, it's, a, it's another tsunami for 15 minutes after. To them, which is only offset by the uh, by the docu chance. Yeah, it is. It's I said it's that relentlessness I, the, of getting to a football first, uh, like no other team can do in no other ground in the world. I think there's a point at which I don't think as a Liverpool player you've got a choice but not be first to a ball. It's not even a will. You you know there's a momentum the crowd will take you to, and that's I'm I'm. One of the things I'm going to be most nervy about in the post-Klopp phase is whether we can get that back. But I think seeing, up, seeing the performance of our... And it's a bit of a cliche to sort of laud the crowd, and especially as we're, as we're, what we're part of that. But I saw it at Wembley a few weeks ago. It was a salutary reminder of what a Liverpool crowd can do when it decided to carry a team of young players through that half an hour and make them the better team against the odds. But... It was a reminder that actually, as big as as big as the manager has been, our crowd remains the greatest asset this club has. And I know that's a cliche, but any manager that can harness that's in business. I, I think we're getting to the point though where we we we're in, we, we have to be careful not to overplay this idea that they're now they're underdogs all the time. That, yeah. they're, they're young players. We're getting to the point where you can say Jarrell Quanser. You say, well, he's just a Premier League centre back who's playing yeah. in a Premier League game, albeit that's the biggest he's ever done. It's only his sixth start in the Prem. You know, Endo, I think we're getting to the point where it's like, well, 
Well, yeah, you know, do you, who do you want? Who do you want instead of Endo in, in the Premier League? Not many. You know, he's he's right in there, and I think that. I, I was guilty of it in the, in the build-up thinking Liverpool going to have to dig deep and really sort of put the grit in but I had to think Liverpool they played well they, yeah. they, they, they're, like, they're, they're a proper football team as well they've got footballers all over but, the pitch you were talking on, on Friday about Elliot and saying about having people you can trust their touch probably aside from Nunes in the game everyone everyone was there maybe Gomez at, at the same time but Gomez is more sort of his pass if you like everyone on that pitch was sort of the equal of, of their city counterpart, if not better, in terms of what they did with the ball. Yeah, I think the, the, this is important, Neil. But the next thing is we got to see it. You don't get it that often. But my favourite sight in football is the opposition are arguing amongst themselves <laughs> while the grounds are blaze. Yeah. And those city players, they were like, "And this isn't right. What's yeah. happening? Here? What's the way we're being pulled here and there?" And to the idea of you just said before with them, the nine minutes that Ian referred to, the ball doesn't go out. But well, we were doing the same thing second half. They were, and I, I remember seeing Foden hack it clear. I was thinking, "How often have I seen a city player hack it clear to no one?" Yeah. But it was like this. I just need to get this away. But then it was coming back, and they they love to get. Set City get the shell and then pressure. Second half, Liverpool just don't let them ever get set, let yeah. alone do the next bit. And that to me was, and then they're arguing because they can't understand why this is happening. Rodri feels like I'm on my own here. Why isn't that someone else is saying I've got to be the ball? They've gone, I think, yeah. City in quite a big way. I think so as well. I mean, they, you have to remember as well, they had a massive moment right before half time. And I think if Trent's in that position instead of Kyle Walker, they go, it goes 2 0. He just yeah. has to pick the right ball and he blasts it out of play. And you think, that was, I think that was the game. For, for City that, and they, they let it go and I wonder if they go in a half time think oh, we've missed our we've missed our kill there but in the second half you're right I mean I don't I don't <laughs> a ridiculous statement coming about the Guardiola superior knowledge of football <laughs> but you, but you never take Kevin De Bruyne off never take Kevin De Bruyne off in a game like that because at some point there's going to be a pass that needs to be played and he'll be the one who plays it but the fact that he turns to someone like Kovacic tells you exactly what he thought his team was missing. His, his, his team was missing just someone to be around the ball and to win it. And City are, City are unbelievable <coughs> at that. You look at the, you know, Bernardo Silva rowing with with Salah. But I mean, Bernardo Silva very lucky not to catch Diaz when he's running through because I, I saw John McGinn get sent off for for a not dissimilar challenge for Villa. He tries to do it. Rodri was lucky not to catch a Rod, ball. Rodri not, not, not to get a second yeah. yellow as well. Um, and then you look at. I think if you want to sum it up, just look at Kyle Walker and Rodgers trying to stop Diaz down the down the left wing late on, where you know that should be meat and drink for those two in terms of speed, strength, whatever. And he just got add off, and I think there was just a lot of that in the second half. It just felt like there was moments where you expected, and they they will have expected to come out with the ball and be in control of a situation, and they weren't because Liverpool were stronger, faster, better. We it's important to say that we don't make them look ordinary, Ian, because they're not ordinary. They're exceptional. They're exceptional in every single area. But we don't just match them, we surpass them second mm -hmm. half. And that to me is, it's almost in a way the beginning, middle and end of the matter that you, you, that's why you are as proud of them as you are. But to Neil's point as well, it's why you've maybe just got to look at them and go, these are great players. Let's not feel sorry for ourselves. I like that I've loved the entire season. I wrote about it yesterday. No excuses. All season it felt like the manager's just gone, I haven't got time for excuses. We've got to get on. Last season, it felt like there was a lot of excuses knocking around the place, and some of them I think were really, really valid, you know, in lots of different ways over the course of the campaign. This season, it's just been about no excuses. Every single time you take the pitch, you represent Liverpool, you do your best. This is how we play, this is who we are, let's go. I think you're spot on. And I think, you know, if there was a day for excuses, it probably was yesterday, given how many players were missing. And, you know, I know I caught some of the kind of preamble before the game, and, and, and Carragher was talking a little bit about how important it was to have Mo Salah out on the pitch. And if Liverpool did manage to do that from the start, then it wouldn't be a million miles away from their first 11. And I'm thinking, Jamie, it, it, there's half a team missing here. There's like legitimately, I would say, five, six, maybe even seven lads. If all fit and fire and start that game against Manchester City, especially against Manchester City, I think you can have conversations about different games where maybe Jota plays or Diaz plays. But against City, I think you always want Jota playing, always. So, and I thought Diaz was great, by the way. So... There's so much adversity going into a game of that magnitude where you can feel sorry for yourself. The manager could feel sorry for himself. Certainly, some of the players could do, but it doesn't happen. And there's, I mean, there's leaders all over the park, and there's lads who who have come to the party time and time again. And I know we'll talk about individual performances, but it's not only the lads that are missing. You're thinking 
even the ones that have started, like Sabos, like you know, he can't do ninety. Well, he's not match fit. He's not match fit. He's clearly you know not, not match fit. Salah's you know not match fit. You know, he's not got ninety, and the manager's got big decisions to make because there was a lot of chat going into the game, and people were saying, "Well, he's got to play Salah. He's got to play Salah." But I'm thinking, well, he's only had fifteen minutes in midweek, and. He'll want Salah to finish the game, and that's a balancing act because the game could be taken away from you. Where when Salah arrives onto the pitch, it could be done and dusted. So he's got to back his boys. They've got to step up, and they absolutely do. But it's a real tricky one for the manager because there must have been a temptation there to go with the likes of Salah because he's so important and his record against City is second to none. But he holds him back, proves to be the right thing to do. But then he's got lads all over the park, as I said before, just stepping up and coming back to the party time and time again. Harvey Elliott, he must be on his knees, that lad, to flog them, to flog them. You know, not only the Wembley thing, but there's been loads of other games where he's gone the, he's gone the distance and he's had to, and he's put in really high-level performances. And again, yesterday, I thought he was one of those where maybe the first 10, 15, it's, it's flying by him a little bit, but he finds himself and he delivers an unbelievable performance from there on in. And so many of them did that, Neil. So many of them did that. And you're right. No, there was there was almost there's no time for excuses here. There's a league title to be won, and Liverpool are banging it. The big thing, though, Ian, is the the penalty decision. I'm annoyed we've almost got to talk about it because the quality of the game, the quality of the Liverpool performance. But we have to. I think it's a massive call for Big Alls. He's <laughs> under massive pressure uh, in a split second there, and. I think that first and foremost, I don't know. I just don't know if you can see it properly. But this is back to this is the issue around the fucking clear and obvious thing as well, which is he can't see anything. So it's acted as though he's made a call, but he can't see it. So he's not he's not adjudicated the decision. The football's happened, and it's sort of gone on from there. And you know, it is a foul on the penalty area. I I think the penalty area, the size of the penalty area, or the shape of the penalty area should be changed. I've got tons of sympathy that something bloody stupid is happening in the corner of the penalty area if a player's facing the wrong way shouldn't lead to a, a clear shot. Loads and loads of sympathy, but the rules are the rules. It's a foul on the penalty area. It's a foul all day. It's a, it's a disgrace, to be honest. It, it, it is. It's not a sort of a disgrace. And I couldn't tell in the ground. I'm in the cop on it. I remember saying to me, Dad, that looks a bit that looks a bit interesting, that one there, but you can't really know until you see it back. But it's just a free kick all day long. It's a free kick, and I know everyone said it, but anywhere else on the pitch, that's a free kick. And listen, maybe the referee, maybe maybe he can't see it where he is. I think, I think Oliver used to be kind of the top referee in this country. I think there was no real arguments. I think he's almost been pulled back into the mire now and he's just like the rest of them. I think he's been like that for a while, to be honest. I don't mm. see really a top referee. I think they're all capable of howlers and in the grand scheme of things, it ends up being that because when you look back at it, and I think it's out well on the on the video yeah. stuff, isn't it? How you can look at that and go, I think he, he's, he's something, was it something like it was an inevitable kind of coming together Reasonable. or something like that. Reasonable is the word. How is it an inevitable coming together or, or what you've just said, Daniel? He, he kind of studs him in the chest. I, I don't think, I wonder, like, what the reason for Oliver not giving it is. Is is, he, is it he gets the ball first or is it, I don't think he's got him. I, I don't think he's got him. He does get a good sight of it, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I, I, I mean, because real time, I thought, ooh, that's, that's a penalty. Real time, and that was, the, the game went on, obviously. But if he's saying to the VAR... No, no, he got the ball. I can understand why the VAR would go, well, if you think he got the ball, he did get the ball. But if he says, oh, I don't think he touched them or, you know, I don't think it's enough contact for a penalty, the VAR has to say, it is, you know. They've like, got to be stepping it, in, it, it is, you They've know. They've got to be stepping I saw, in. I mean, I saw, obviously, there was, there's been a lot of social media fallout, but I saw the City account shared in the Jota, Oliver Skip one from last season. You see that and saying, well, you can't complain. You know, you had that. <laughs> everyone point pointing out, a foul and a, red, and a yellow card for the, for the. I mean, he should have been sent off, Jota, but you foul and a yellow card. That sums it up, doesn't it? You 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 go up with your foot like that and you catch someone, regardless of what the ball, what happens with the ball, it's a foul. He's lost. He's lost his. I'll come in a minute, Robert. He's lost his head, Docker. I think this is an important point. This is part of what this whole thing is. You build pressure, you get a corner. Yeah. You build pressure, you get another corner. The crowd's he's up. New into the game. He's to new to the fixture. He's he's had the miss in inverted commas, and I think this is a really important part. This is you know, and you can end up saying, well, because it is innocuous in a really weird way, in that way it is, but it is just a foul. But he's he's lost control of himself, yeah. and that to me is why Neil. You know, that's literally part of playing a game of footy is that you've got to be able to manage your emotions. Doc, who's gone. Yeah, you look at there's so many of the, these penalties, and I agree with you about the the sort of sometimes the, the punishment and the crime doesn't feel the same. But there was, there's ones where you see a defender and he's just dawdling over a clearance and he goes to clear it, and someone just gets the toe on the ball and he he takes everything, and you go, it's probably not a penalty, you know, like you don't deserve to concede the goal because of that, but it is, it's a foul, and that's the same, isn't it? You know, it would have been a soft way for City to lose that the biggest game or potentially lose it. He might not, you know, he might have missed, but I think if that. I think if that's the 79th minute and not the 99th, I think that's getting given. 
I think in uh, in all the analysis we're going to see this week, they're going to trot out the usual suspects. They're going to have to be some... <laughs> Mike, Klopp with Mike Dean was unbelievable, uh, by the way. That was... That was I mean, he, the, man, he, the manager's right down the, perfect. Right down the barrel of the camera went, what? Mike Dean, great appointment. <laughs> <laughs> that was unbelievable. It's, yeah. <laughs> it, there's going to be some gymnastics, but but, but some people are going to say, this is that's just a pen. I mean, even if you start... Firstly, are we not... In the business, especially in the modern game of protecting footballs from unnecessary just, risks just to their health. Just have a notification, by the way, saying, should Liverpool have had a late penalty, Dan McGallagher gives his verdict. So there you go. Oh, well, That's well, something to look go, forward so, yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't be putting studs into some just below someone's neck. I mean, that's it's, it's ridiculously dangerous. For, for And also, even though the, this flimsy argument, technical argument, oh, but he got the ball. What, by having his foot... In a in a vertical position, uh, parallel to somebody's torso, near near their throat, you can't. That's just not. It's ludicrous on every single measure, and it feels to me as though the ref and and his colleagues in the, in the VAR are. It's again, it's a narrative decision, really, isn't it? And <clears throat> not not in a just way. They're just going. Oh, it's so late in the game, and he didn't mean. And as Neil says, and, he, and he's not going to get a shot away. Oh. And also they think, and we're going to have to send him off if we give this. Can we just pretend it didn't happen? That's the first, I think that's the first I instinct you, you see. That it, pretend it didn't the, happen. And then when it goes to VAR, it's like, oh, God. I think the time thing, and I think the idea of, I just don't, I, not only do I think 99th minute, I think, I think it's possibly different if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's Wolves versus Bournemouth. Yeah. Yeah. Minute. I yeah. think there's this idea of do, they, cares, do, yeah. they, do they want to have a situation where you've so got a week's worth of a week's worth of recrimination and, and, and a full title decider where it goes to a video assistant referee decision because it is the last kick de facto the last kick Ian and I think that that is there and in loads of ways and I, I you know, I'm not. I'm not even being devil's advocate. I've actually got a ton of more sympathy for that position than you'd be surprised about. Even though it goes against us, I can understand how human beings end up sort of doing that. But then this is back to the madness of you've given them these screens to make sure this shit's got right. Yeah. Yep, that, that that's the thing. That's the thing, Neil. It, it, it's the screen thing, and it and it and as I say. I'm not a huge fan of Oliver. I think he's been on the decline for a, for a little bit. He, he strikes me as a fellow who's believed his own hype a little bit for a bit too long, but. If he can't fully see, and I've not watched it back from his from his angle, but I know Salah's really close, and Salah doesn't appeal for it, so you can understand why one or two might be thinking, "Well, is it is it just a is it just one of them?" But then when you see it on the screen, how can you how can you not give it? How can you not give that? And you know, it's a game of football that is it's so big in terms of what it means, and you know, Liverpool could be. Could be looking back at that at the end of the season, thinking that is that is a massive, massive decision that's gone against them on the back of two or three other really, really significant ones. And I, I was surprised that, having watched some of it back, that the lads in the studio didn't really think it was a penalty. I just think it's 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 one of them where it's it's all day long. It's always been a penalty where you hit someone that eye. How can it not be a foul? How can it not be a foul? And you know the manager, the manager's absolutely spot on. I thought he handled it really well. But I think what you've got. In this squad now, I don't think it's one of them where they're going to feel sorry for themselves. I think it'll drive them on. I think I think you've seen it this season where when there has been that kick in the bollocks or it's gone against them and there's been adversity, it's driven them on and I've got absolutely no doubt it's another one of them where they'll park it and it'll drive them on. Do you know, do you know what my, my frustration with those kind of decisions is, is? It's always, it's as though there's a, I'm going to use the expression, possession is nine-tenths of the law. So what's happened in the moment is the, is the abiding fact and you've got to go some to correct. I know this is about the clear and obvious. Why can they not put themselves in in a secondary moment again? Now let's just just clear our minds for a second. We've got a few seconds to do this. Both you, the ref on the pitch, and us. And let's reimagine we're seeing this now through clearer eyes, right? What's our decision now? Forget your previous decision. But it's like the the, the decision that yeah. has been made in the instant has this status, which is call sort of it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It, its status should be erode. Once you call the VR into play, that status should be it's ripped up. It never happened. I don't we started you, from scratch. I mean, just this weekend, I, I, I hate referee debate. I really do. But just this weekend, United get two penalties against Everton. Mm. Technically, penalties. The first one is the softest sort of. It's a bought penalty from Garnacho. He just moves the ball. Gets a little tap on the on the thing, goes over. There's no way it puts you down for a penalty, but it's a penalty. And and the argument there will be, yeah, but he's caught them. You know, he's he's he's, he's made contact with them in the penalty area. And you go, yeah, 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 right, yeah, it's a penalty. I hate them. I don't think it's a penalty. I, I, I you know, you think I remember Calvert Lewin getting one at Anfield. Klopp referenced that yeah. in his interview, didn't he? Because mm. it was the same interviewer. And a lot of people say it's not a penalty. Like, well, he just puts his hands on his back, and it's a, you know, you give him the opportunity to go down. Take take that. Let's say let's say you've you've conceded that penalty. Mm. 
and Liverpool have conceded, you go, wow, you give him the opportunity there to get go down, that gets given. Remember the World Back one at Brighton, where yeah. he oh, kicks the, bo- kick, oh, he yeah. kicks the bottom that was, of the last kick, and it? he goes down about three or four seconds later, yeah, yeah. and it's never enough to never make him go penalty. down. But they go, well, there's contact there. Yeah, it's yeah, this yeah. thing now where you're going about this high bar, and I say, like, lads, do you want the right decision or not? Because I guarantee there'll be someone who does something not too dissimilar to that in a couple of weeks' time and it absolutely gets given and that's what kicks you in the balls. I'm, 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 because I'm, you know there's absolutely zero consistency with any of this. Let's, let's have it right. A week ago we were talking about people saying monumental errors were made in the Liverpool game where the, uh, the ball wasn't passed back to the goalkeeper or was passed back to the goalkeeper and two minutes later Liverpool scored and then we're in the same people or some of the same people are talking and saying well that's a 50-50 you know like I said I wrote I wrote a piece earlier early last week and said everyone goes on about wanting consistency they just don't they don't want consistency they just want their decisions to go their way and the other decisions to go against the teams they don't like and another, another example Liverpool got away with one the week before slightly you know I think it was overplayed but this week they've been on the absolute They've been on the but end they're of, very of a different. stinker. Yeah, yeah, but they've been on the end of a yeah. stinker and another another one. And I saw I saw Morgan Gibbs White giving an interview yesterday. And maybe we're not interested in Forrest, but Morgan Gibbs White talking as if like, you know, the only reason Forrest is 17th in the league is these referees just keep keep killing them. Well, I watched it, it was a a poor challenge that could have been a well, should have been a red card in a game he lost one nil. This is a bit different. This is this is a black and white, I think. Like this this is the difference between a win and a and a draw. It is indeed, um, no shadow of a doubt. The manager's determined to have it not undermine a uh, performance or game, um, which I think is significant. Just very, very quick, Rob. Hmm. We've talked about the first 15 where they're lucky not to be punished. <laughs> um, we've talked about the opener feeling a bit soft. Um, but things like in that first half period, the move that ends with Sabozlai's header showed that we were we were more than a match. And that I think that they put together that passage of play in the in, in the first half across twenty minutes or so. I think that's part of why you get the second half. There's the bad, which is the first fifteen minutes, but then there's also this is how we can play football. Yeah, I think they realised they had the, they had the right to be there in the first half without having you know the, the crowd wasn't at its at its. Uh, at its zenith in that first half, it, the players were just playing with intelligence and quality. And I, there's a point Neil made quite a bit earlier. I think uh, we all we all have in a roundabout way is that you can be what's the word? Look at our team sheet and, and go look at the inexperience and the, and the lack of profile really of those players. But I think those players, you know, they do the respect. Um, we're talking about Quanza, Bradley, Elliot, Endo, Kelleher. Ma- Kelleher, exactly. The, so where have I rattled off four or five? And I'm probably there's probably another example in there as well. And they are what they're actually showing is they're not they're not uh, second tier players performing out of their skins because their manager is is pumping them up and the crowd gets them going. They're really 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 good footballers. Um, and I think, but they have to learn that themselves as well. They're finding it out bit by bit by bit. But I think they found out a lot more about themselves. And the, the, those type of lads, I think, in that first half, where they, where, they, where they eventually sort of got on top of City, just through quality, really, through quality, intelligence, and, and uh, yeah, and the, and the way they were able to apply themselves. Um, on those individual performances, uh, let's start off with profile. Uh, profile in a big way, Ian. Um, Van Dijk, yet again, absolutely tremendous. The only thing the performance lacked was the winner. Uh, that was what I was thinking with this late raft yeah, of corners. That we're back in Virgil van Dijk's universe. Uh, he gets his head on one of them. It's the only thing it lacked. Everything else, he was just tremendous again. Thought he was sensational. He's having some season, and you know it, it kind of makes you laugh when people are doing some of these comparisons with with other centre halves. And I get the whole like you know different eras and all that kind of stuff. But I genuinely can't think of another centre back who's hit these levels. I just can't. I just can't think of another one who's hit these levels. He's absolutely sensational in every facet of the game. He can do everything. He can do absolutely everything. And again, you know, he's had to really kind of step up in recent weeks because he has had to play with different partners and the team has been a little bit weaker than maybe you'd want to see. Um, But he's demonstrating all the kind of all the kind of attributes you'd want to see from a captain. And if anything, the armband almost make, makes him look a little bit taller and a little bit stronger. And that sounds mad given the size of the man anyway. But I think he's really embraced that role of just leading this team and just driving them forward. And, you know, he's almost... For me now, he, it's at the point where, you know, one or two people outside of Liverpool's bubble aren't willing to give him credit. But you just look a bit silly. 
you just look a bit stupid now because I think we are talking about certainly he's like one of the all time great centre backs for me. One of the all time great centre backs. Never mind Premier League era, and what he's what he's done since he's arrived at the club. He was that transformative signing that kicked them on along with the goalkeeper as well and maybe one or two others. But honest to God, the level he's demonstrating now, and you know, you see that bit yesterday with, with Haaland, and we had a little joke about it off air and stuff, and it was like like two gladiators kind of about to go at each other. Um, but you were in no doubt, you were in no doubt that Van Dijk wasn't going to come off kind of you no know, on yeah. top of that contest. You kind of knew he was. You knew the worst thing that was going to happen here was maybe a, a kind of weak shot on target, and that's what unfolds. But um, but from start to finish, but over the course of the campaign, that's important. Yes, there's been one or two moments. People will maybe talk about the Arsenal thing, and that was live on telly, and it got a lot of traction at the time. But you'd allowed one of them. Everyone can have one of them. But over the course of the season, but over the course of his time at Liverpool as well, he's been nothing short of sensational. And yesterday was another example of that. I, I think you talk about leadership with with a player, and you know, you go back to sort of old tropes a little bit of like you know talking and sort of you know being willing to to, to call people out and do these things. But I think the the best that epitome of what Van Dijk's leadership is is just watch how, how much this team follows him and how much he has followed him this season and you know you think of he had a big learning curve in the first month of the season he got sent off for descent and you see him now he, he's, he'll get away from the referee we're not going to get involved in all that all that stuff you see the composure of, of, of young players of all players on the pitch okay yeah you can have moments where it gets away from you and it goes a bit mad you even see in that Tottenham game, when they go down to nine men, Liverpool don't start playing silly, silly things. You know they probably they probably do a couple of silly things in the game to get red cards or un- unfortunate things, but they don't start changing the way they play. That they're, they're utterly sort of aware of what's needed to be done, and that comes from the manager. I think it comes from the captain as well. I agree, I agree with you, and he's the best centre back I've ever seen. I, I say this all the time, and. That doesn't mean he's the best centre back of all time in, in in football history because he might not have the medal collection and people go oh, about well, oh you've got to do it this and you've got to win six Ballon d'Ors you know you, five's not enough and you've got to you've got to you know, we'll, we'll find a stat that shows that you got dribbled past three times in a game and that shows that you're not that good. If I'm picking a team that's got to play and win for my life, I'm having our goalie, Allison, and I'm having our centre back Van Dijk. He's, I think. He's the best in the, I probably in the history of the British game. I think we can safely say. I mean, I I, I was lucky enough to watch Hanson and Lawrence and in the flesh, and yeah. there was they were fairly. I think they're pretty much peerless. Then those two. I mean, in Europe, you could have conversations about others, lots of few others. But before the Premier League era, they're clearly the, the best the, two. The only and two. He's, he's he's better than them. The only two in my my three. I'd say actually in my lifetime ever in terms of anywhere. That I would I would compare would be Sergio Ramos. I think I don't think you can argue with Sergio Ramos and how brilliant a player he was. John Terry in, a, in the Premier League sense, I think for an era was the I think he was the best in the world. And Rio? Um, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't have Rio Ferdinand because I think Rio Ferdinand was was sort of I don't think he had an influence on the team. Mm. Rio Ferdinand when he played, I think he was just a really good player who who, who, who was you know, really consistent. But I don't I don't ever feel like he was sort of. You know, making other people better or, mm-hmm. or influencing the sort of the way that the team played. Oh, oh Manchester United are going to play with a high line. You know, Vir- Virgil, don't forget how brave this this, this team is. Virgil's in his thirties and then mm. he's defending on the halfway line against, you know, Haaland. <laughs> Haaland, yeah, yeah. You know, and and, and never mind Haaland, Foden and, and De Bruyne are on the ball and you know whoever else. So, yeah, I. It was your third one. Just oh, sorry. Yeah, it was um, Cannavaro. Okay, from from uh, you know the last. I think the last defender to win. Yeah, a Ballon d'Or. Um, they're the only three that I can put in that that bracket, and and to be honest, I've seen a lot of good centre back. You know, Tony Adams and Vidic and and Rio Ferdinand, Sol Campbell was unbelievable for the, for the spell. Van Dyke's all, all of their good bits, and 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 more on top. Neil, what you were saying there about, and I think John Terry is one of the one of the greatest in the Premier League. But where Van Dyke positions himself on the halfway line, I mean, John yeah. Terry, no, exactly, he had, he had yeah, a lot yeah. of qualities. But he doesn't want to be on the halfway line because he had a bit of a lack of pace, didn't he? Yeah, he was yeah. great at kind of marshalling the defence and positioning himself. But I remember speaking to before the Anfield Rap, speaking to Stefan Hon show about Sammy Ippy, and I thought Sammy was great, by the way. Mm. Absolutely top draw centre half. I remember asking him about Van Dyke and kind of how Liverpool play in the high line. And Stefan Hon show wasn't a bad centre half himself, by the way. He's a very good, good centre half, edge of the box, could do all the clearances, all that, put his body in front of anything. But he was like, 
I love Sammy Ape, it's a bit, and I'm here to talk about Sammy Ape, but my God, there's not a chance me and Sammy could be anywhere no. near where Van Dyke puts himself on that line. We would get absolutely killed, marmalised, and I think that's that's probably the same for a lot of centre-halves. You're talking about some some greats there, and people like Adams was a great centre-half for Arsenal. Imagine him on the halfway line. Yeah. Imagine, imagine, imagine but, people like Pallister on the halfway line. I've, I've heard Steve Bruce get thrown into conversations recently, which blew my mind, by the way. Imagine him on the halfway line. Honest yeah. to God, it would be but an you, absolute disaster. You, to, you do have to allow that the game didn't dictate that. Of course, that. So, so of course. If, you trained, if, you, yeah, if, course. if John Terry and that, they trained... But you've got to have the physical attributes you're right, you're, as well. Like, you're right, you would, I, would, I would have doubts. For, for their... And, but what I would include, Ramos, Cannavaro, Terry um, in... I mean, I didn't see Baresi. I, I missed. I missed his pomp, really. But would be they they influenced the whole team and the whole team the way the team defended was was down to them, wasn't it? I mean, in a way, people like Hippie and Carragher were because they made they, they were penalty box defenders, weren't they? But I think you know, I think I think Carragher was talking about it yesterday, wasn't he? he? Said Virgil's got to play everyone's game today, you know, in the back yeah. four and probably the goalkeeper as well. He probably didn't because they all stepped up, but. He did at the same time in terms of he, he he was responsible for them and I think the fact the way Quanta comes through that first sort of 15, 20 minutes and grows into it I don't think that happens if it's someone else alongside no, that, him I'm on Quanta I think that Virgil is very very important for him uh, over the course mm. of the game but he also let's give him the praise that he deserves it's it's a hell of a performance for someone who's making his sixth Premier League start in, a, in that sort of game Yeah I was I was a bit surprised how everyone was oh my god I can't believe we're going in against City with Kwanzaa I thought he's I think he's shown enough composure and intelligence and also yeah, he's clearly got a personality that, that wasn't going to phase him it just wasn't going to phase him he does make probably his biggest error well does he get yeah, rinsed he, he miscontrols he, in he the first he tried to dribble past someone then he got tackled and yeah I think it ends with the Foden chance, yeah I think that's second. right yeah it's, it's probably that's probably the first proper error I can I can say he's made in, in, an, in all the appearances he's made this season but beyond that he's, he's, he's fantastically composed also people forget he has a really good shot second half oh. a dribble and a shot <laughs> and I haven't watched him a bit sort of a, a, the younger England teams he's got that in his locker there's a lot more to come from Jar- Jarrell Kwan so he's a real footballing centre half at the moment obviously he's obviously been told don't overcomplicate it you know what at some point they're going to have to unleash him a bit and I think people are going to be shocked just how good he is um, he finds his way uh, the dribbling shots mentioned I think though where I think he's the most impressive second half Ian is just how much he is contributing in general play. He's not just sort of staying next to Van Dyke. He knows there needs to be effectively for this to work for Liverpool. Back to this idea of risk and reward, gambling in certain areas, risking that you need to come out and play right back de facto for a minute here because um, Gomez is, cu- is cut inside. You've got to come there. To me, that's the the tactical responsibility they give him. I think, but also the tactical responsibility he then takes in terms of progressing the play is what I think speaks most highly of him. Yeah, he's so brave as well. Um, I think the braveness really kind of shines through, and you know, he often gets forgotten about now because he's been injured for so long. But 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 Joe Matip will demonstrate sometimes those qualities where he'll drive into midfield and he he doesn't mind kind of punching it through players and, and showing a bit of bravery. And I thought, you know, Quanzer again, you know, for a sixth Premier League start, I think he's he's made less than ten Premier League appearances. I think he's on about nine now with 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 yesterday's game to so go and do that against them. And I'll defend him a little bit on. The one Rob mentioned before, where he um, he does kind of try and carry it out. We've waxed a little bit about Virgil, but I don't think he wants the ball from Virgil there. I think it was one of them, but it, it comes with a little bit of loft, and he's thinking, Christ, I could do without this here right now, you know, because what City play is kind yeah. of coming right onto me. So I'll defend him on that, but I just think to go from the level he was at, Bristol Rovers on loan, I didn't see lots of what happened there, but I believe it was maybe a little bit of a mixed bag to come in and find this level. And in different games and in different moments when Liverpool have really needed him as well, you think about Newcastle away when he comes on, you're thinking, Christ, what could happen here? And he just, and you think maybe there's a little bit of a drill in there, but since, or you've seen more and more of him, and you think, actually, no, there's, there's, there's real quality here, there's unbelievable quality. And at that age as well, we talk about centre halves before, 21. how many are doing it at that age? You see loads of them just find themselves when they're maybe kind of early to mid 20s, and you'd almost see them settle and they, they kind of get comfortable in their own skin, they know what they're about. It seems to me that he knows what he's about right now. Maybe there's a, a tiny bit of a lack of pace where now and again that might get exposed, but he seems clever enough to be able to understand where this position needs to be to counter some of that. 
and you will not get tested more than more than yesterday. Of all the teams in world football, they will put you through the ring of the most. They will find weaknesses if there are weaknesses to be found, and they will test you to the 90th or 99th minute. And he, he came through it with shining colours, I thought. He doesn't play, he played against Wolves in the league. He played Wolves, Palace, Burnley twice in the Luton. That was the only five games he'd started in the Premier League. So to go from that to City it's and to play the way he does, that's joke. unbelievable. I don't think anyone in the ground is thinking, once we're into the meat of that game, no. God, I wish we had Kanate. No. I don't think anyone sat... I, I didn't catch myself musing on that one. God, that would make a difference at this stage of the game. And obviously it would, because he's a, he's a sensational defender. But but quite the drop-off is not that big now. To, it's just a low, If we'd bought a young defender... I know this is a cliche we've rattled. If we'd bought a young defender at that level, we'd be delighted with his progress so far. OK, uh, more on individual performances in a second. But before then, uh, last week I spoke to Rachel Ramsey about her film Copper 71. Uh, here's that. It's Neil Atkinson, and I am joined by Rachel Ramsey, who is the co-director of Copper 71. Copper 71 will have been at cinemas from Friday, just gone. Uh, it is across 140 screens in the country, uh, which I am astounded by, uh, and it speaks to the marvellousness of the film and the co-director, Rachel. Do us the film in a sentence or two. Um, this is the story of an unofficial, mostly, well, up till now, completely unknown, um, Women's Football World Cup, hosted in Mexico City in 1971. Um, and it holds the record for the highest attended women's sporting event in history, and no one even think about it. What, just out of interest, how many attendees were there? At least 110,000. It least... sold out the Azteca Stadium. So 110,000 at the Azteca Stadium in 1971, and no one knew a thing about it. Um, apart from you know the 110,000 people that were there, yeah. and all of the women who played in it, who for the last 50 years haven't either been able to, haven't felt that they can, or were actively repressed from telling their story. So this this film of yours, therefore, this documentary is about a secret history, about something that wasn't told and even yeah. wasn't acknowledged. And in fact, one could argue, and I suspect you do, that it was an attempt to almost expunge it from the historical record. Yeah, I, I think at the time, the idea of women playing on the scale that they suddenly did within this tournament and being given the same treatment as the Men's World Cup from 1970, obviously Pelé's World Cup hosted in Mexico, mm -hmm. was uh, it was the same infrastructure that was used the following year, 1971. Entrepreneurial businessmen realising they could make a buck off it yep. um, and good on them for giving them this, this space. And then suddenly it sort of it didn't fit with the, the building narrative of men's football being so unique, so special, getting so much sponsorship. There's a feeling, I think, that the men's sport would be diluted if women were allowed to play. Well, me women's football was banned in, the, in, in this country in the early 1920s, something that led to it being banned in a number of other places at the same time. So this idea, therefore, of this tournament in 1971, it is first and foremost, it is in and of itself a rebellious act. The idea of putting it on, it was rebellious. The idea of playing it, it was rebellious. Women did not stop playing football in 1920. They continued to do so. But the point was, was that for these individual women themselves, the infrastructure didn't exist in a formalised yeah. way. No, definitely. I mean, yeah, women women didn't stop playing when the English FA said, no, nope, you're not allowed to play on any of our affiliated pitches. And that was copied around the world. But it was forced underground and resources were taken away and you're suddenly not allowed to play on a pitch. And, it, and it's something also about sort of the respect that it's given. Yeah. And you're, so you're really undermining the fact that these women should be able to play. But what we've discovered and what you know a lot of people have known, but it's just not been public for a long time um, and not part of the, um, the more expected uh, narrative put out by many football establishments, is that there was just an incredible subculture of rebellious women playing all over the world. Yeah. And this story isn't just about a team from from the UK, it's the teams from the other five, there were six teams that were invited to go and play. So it was a small tournament, but it was sort of, it was on, a, on this crazy big scale. Yeah. And the women from Italy, Argentina, Mexico, Denmark, France, and England, who all went to play, you know, I spent the best part of two years with our, te with our team, researching it, finding all these women, going to meet them, spending a lot of time getting to know them before you shove a camera in their face. Um, but all of them had very similar things to say. Like, in terms of what, what it was they did, I have to say the first thing to take from it, to take from the film, is it's funny. 
the funny these women there's of so many they are. no of course they are because not least because there's, there's this huge rebellious act no, I know it, yeah. that happens first and foremost as well let's be clear about this people full stop get to be funny but one of the things I loved about the film is the film is the film packs a series of laughs yeah well you know if you're gonna interview a load of badass ladies in their 70s who are absolutely <laughs> punk back in their day and who don't, and didn't care ha- then and don't care now no they are gonna have st- <laughs> they're gonna have stuff to say um, and they say it in all these de- in all their different languages <laughs> and they say it, and Nick, the way it's structured the film is that they're all talking to each other and they all almost take a take the the story of the tournament line by line. Yeah. And you know, their memories were incredible as well. So we made the decision not to show the women any of the footage because we wanted to really find out what when that the footage that we found that hadn't been seen in fifty years at yeah. the time well, when before doing the interviews, because we wanted to really work out what their memories and what their feelings and what their real their, their emotion about the, that period was. And the accuracy with which they described what happened over 50 years ago was was incredible. And, you know, they remembered exactly which player from which team tackled them in which way at what point. <laughs> <laughs> and who threw which, you know, version of, you know, whether it was like, some, some physical, some more metaphorical punches. But, you know, they were like, it was, a, they were so passionate and they were such talented athletes and so powerful that that was a genuine threat to the status quo. Well, here's the trailer, uh, first and foremost, Copper 71. This is unbelievable. What year was this? 1971, Mexico City. A tournament of unprecedented scale, hidden for over 50 years. La Copa Mundial Femenina. 110,000 personnes. Mamma mia. It's impressionant. It was euphoric. Goal! Goal! Little did we know what was to come. What's a nice girl like you doing playing football though? FIFA. They don't like anything about it. There is a lot of resistance. No, I think Soleil is a good gag. When we came back, mm-hmm. no bunches of flowers, nobody there to meet you. And then we found out we got banned. Thus, women's football is crushed. I have some women to tell you about. You don't know them, but you will. We paved the way for what it's become today. (laughs) It was important for women to see that this was possible. These women were challenging so many norms. They're warriors. Perception of women's soccer has changed dramatically. There's no stopping us now. It's up to us to make sure that history is right. Back with Rachel after the trailer there. Let's talk about your side of this, your part of this process, because to have made this sort of, to have committed to making this sort of feature, to now see it be on 140 screens in this country, we'll talk about where it's going to be elsewhere in a second. It is, like, I think it's an enormous achievement. We've just read uh, a very, very warm review in The Guardian uh, from Peter Bradshaw of the film, which, again, it's an enormous achievement. The fact that it's getting covered in the mainstream in the way in which it is, it is absolutely brilliant. I'm sure it's what you wanted. I suspect it wasn't what you thought it would be when you started. No, and I, I think, you know, we, we knew we had a really strong filmmaking team yeah. and we had to reach out to all over the world. You know, you think when you, you kind of encourage people, you know, you're always going to say this as part of the as part of the filmmaking team, but, you know, watch the credits and you'll see how many people are involved yeah. in this. And that's everything from legal teams to the marketing to the, to the research and the archivists. Um, but I think in, one big thing when you start, asking anyone, whether that's one person, or in this case, over 30 people from six different countries who are quite traumatized by the experience you're gonna talk about. And when you ask them to entrust you with their story, you have to set out there and not make any promises. You say, you know, we're gonna do our best. Please let us look after this and yeah. we will get it out there. And part of, part of the process of making a film like this is getting, it, is getting it onto screens and having people watch it. Because otherwise you're asking someone for their time and their trust without really repaying them um, with, something that people can people can watch so the fact that this has had the 
I mean, the reception that it's had so far and that, you know, that we've hit this sort of, there's a, you know, it's undeniable there's a zeitgeist around women's football right now, which wasn't quite the same. I mean, we, when we started three years ago, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't have predicted this mm -hmm. as, as it's happened right now. But it is, it's been hugely emotional and just getting to see all the women in the film who get to go and... Well, you've got them do doing some Q&As, haven't they're you, doing their across own, the yeah, country? They're doing, oh, they're, they're loving it. They're doing their own <laughs> thing. They're going to film festivals. <laughs> They've got their own... You know, there's, I, our PR team's been amazing with them as well and loved working with them. And that's something I can say. I actually had a great thing from like the marketing people saying, you know, everyone from the company wants to come and work on this mm. because, um, because they just love looking after these ladies who and like, helping them get around the country and do things. And, yeah. Uh, you screened it tonight, in fact, in Liverpool. Obviously, you know that, that this is going out after then. So let's be really, really clear about this. It is for the week where this is going out. Mm -hmm. Monday, it'll be the opening weekend, and then the following yeah. week, it's still on 140 screens. It's then going to be. On, so we're dropping. It's 140 screens for the opening weekend, which will have just gone. Yes. <laughs> and then we're still in around 70 screens for three weeks. So there's plenty That's of loads, time to go and see it. Loads of time to go and see it. Also, what you're really keen to say is that it's it's very, very good for over tens. Yeah, uh, that's it, they're a big part of this story. You want you want people, you want children coming to see it. Yeah, I mean, there's you know, there's because it's in different languages, there's some subtitles, but it's really that's some of the only bit that. Yeah. But you know, we've never had any complaints from any any of the kids, and just and I think I think they really appreciate. And the reason for watching it in the cinema again, we're obviously always going to be biased and we're going to push for that, but is. You know, we've created it, and with our editing team, and with the sound design, and with the colorists. The sound of the trailer's unreal, by the way. The sound yeah, of the trailer's Yeah, well, I mean, Dan, our sound design did an amazing job on that. Yeah. And, um, and really committed to it as well. And I think when the, when you see it on that big screen, and you've got the sound everywhere, and you've got a collective of people as well, you know, you feel like you're, we, we want to transport people back to 1971, and yeah. back to this parallel universe, where everything could have been different, and yeah. should have been different. And so then, and those emotions that come through it, I mean, I, I still get goosebumps watching it because the footage almost shouldn't exist. And, you know, and it already hasn't been seen in over 50 years, which is, again, in its own right, quite extraordinary. And I think, you know, the more that we can normalize the fact that this was what was happening is how we can build stronger roots for everywhere that the game, women's game is going now. And it's gonna be available globally as well. Yes, so we are releasing, a, we've just released in Canada. We believe we've got Australia, New Zealand coming up, Scandinavia, a couple of other European countries, um, and then USA in June. So lots of opportunity for people to see it. Yeah, summer. go and watch it everywhere. Go and watch it everywhere. You can fly the women all over the, all over the globe, <laughs> drop them into locations. They would love that, yeah. I'm sure they would yeah, from, yeah. The sound of, from the sound of things, the way in which it's gone. Listen, it is available. It is in cinemas across the country now. I honestly cannot believe the number of screens uh, for a film like this. It's absolutely brilliant work. It's great from Rachel. First met Rachel doing a, a documentary on uh, the rent in Rwanda. Uh, and now we have this film, which is downright revolutionary. All the R's. Rachel's wonderful go to the film. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, thank you very much to Rachel. Um, here, I've got Neil Jones, I've got Ian Ryan, Rob Gutman. We're going to uh, crack back on, but we're going on tour with the Anfield Wrap uh, in the international break. Uh, from the Wednesday of the international break, the first Wednesday, when we will be in New York. And then from there, uh, we are going to Boston, uh, to Toronto, to Detroit, uh, Wilmington, and to Washington. Most of those days have actually sold out. I think there's still tickets for Detroit, Wilmington, and Boston. Uh, but do check if you are interested in any of them. It will be a pleasure to see you. And we're at Manford Hall uh, the night before Wolves keep saying we're not going to know what we're going to be talking about the night before Wolves um, and it's true we're not going to know what we're going to be talking about the night before Wolves but uh, general feeling I think is that things matters may well be in Liverpool's hands by then we'll come on to talk about that in a minute or two but I want to do a couple more individual performances I want to talk about you've got us in a way group them together but what the offer is there's similarities in what the offer Endo and McAllister but there's also quite important differences McAllister's ability in this one, Neil, to set the tempo of that game, I thought was astonishing. I thought, I thought he was unbelievable. It, McAllister, yeah. like, do you know what he reminds me of? That's a big shout, but he reminds me of Luka Modric, mm. in that, that you go mm. like, how's he doing, how's he having us off here? Like, he's tiny, but he's not that quick, but he, he's just, he was so far ahead of everyone else on the pitch. You know, he got Rodri booked, didn't he? But that was that was a pretty typical action of him, just reading the, reading the play, bursting through, and having the confidence to, to, to back himself. I think he's getting better. Like since he got almost 
good time and that injury that he got in in December. It's sort of he had he missed a month and he's come back like this sort of idea of like refreshed almost and and right. I'm going to step it up now and you're going to actually you're going to really see what I'm all about. I knew he was scoring a penalty. That's another another good sign. I loved I how much he dwelt on it. I knew he was scoring that penalty. I knew where he was going. I'd have, I'd, have, I'd have been very close to saving it myself, but I wouldn't have got there. <laughs> I knew, you knew. I could. T- you know. You you just think that's going Gerard against Arsenal in the Champions League. That's going. That's going in that position. Like he's just got. I think he's got. I remember speaking to Glenn Murray in the summer when when Liverpool signed him. Glenn Murray trained with him at Brighton, and he said, "You can put your house on him." In any situation, he said, and he, and he used examples like, you know, if you got beat five nil, he said you'd go and send him to do the media. He said because he wouldn't get it wrong. He, he he he's just he's just a, a rock solid professional, but he's also a rock solid professional. He's really really good at football, like a proper proper player. I I mean I know Endo got player of the match off off the club, didn't he? I think the Carlsberg one. I, it was McAllister for me with Endo, pro, you know, good good props for second. I think. He looked like the sort of player that Man City might have looked at and gone, we should have bought him. Could play for Guardiola, no we doubt. Should have, we should have yeah. bought him. I think um, I think McAllister's performance is one of the great midfield performances under Jurgen Klopp. And I think there's been a few. You, know, you think about Fabinho, Henderson, one at different times. The Thiago one against United often gets yeah. talked about. And I understand why, because it's... it's it's lovely on the eye. But you're thinking, oh, no, he's up against that night. I think it's Matic and Fernandez. Pop comes off early. Again, it's back to the opposition. I thought McAllister was sensational from start to finish. It's silk when silk's required. It's steeliness when steeliness is required. And there's just tons and tons of quality in abundance. I thought he was absolutely superb from minute one. And again, he's one of those where you talk about his attitude. When he when the chips are down a little bit, you know he's going to be one of the ones who steps up. Yeah. You absolutely know he is going to be that guy. And I think there was something... When he played United towards the back end of last season, I've mentioned this before, Paul Ince talks about him in terms of what he... And he, Paul Ince just can't believe how good he is. He's like, he can do everything. There's nothing this lad can't do. And you can have a view on Paul Ince, but he does know about midfielders. And yeah. honestly, since... I think there was a little bit of a settling in period for him where he had to adjust. And you understand why, because you're coming and playing under a different manager. He gets that silly decision where he goes, gets sent off and it's, it's obviously never a sending off. But over the last weeks, maybe even two or three months, I think his performance levels, they're not really short of an eight or nine out of ten. And he was backed up by his mate yesterday. I thought Endo was brilliant as well. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it is interesting how it's sort of almost by more by accident than design that they've become the engine room of our midfield, isn't it? Mm-hmm. We've sort of rebuilt... Klopp midfields, what, in the, in the eight, nine years he's been there, it has been about a hell of a lot of graft in midfield. There's no doubt about it. Players sometimes who weren't as easy on the eye or like, liked by supporters, uh, a Henderson or a Wijnaldum or a Milner. Uh, McAllister's got more, in, yeah, more te- technical talent than any of those players. But ultimately, those two working in tandem gives us that that clock thing. And it's interesting because they're diminutive, you know, in size, but they but you know they make up for that with thought with quickness it's, yeah they've been incredible I, I think and I think McCat McAllister I, you, you persuaded me that he probably was man of the match I came out of it quite emotionally thinking it was Diaz um, just because I mean if I, can I divert onto Diaz quickly Neil and t- tell you why I thought he was man of the match yeah go on because because he's at the heart of everything in, and for a forward that's and for a wide forward that's not always an easy thing to do I mean Harlan gets about three touches in the game Nunes has a has an d- interesting game, so some good bit, some bad, but generally a good performance. He's he's Liverpool's best forward, uh, Diaz. I thought yesterday in a game which is in one of Liverpool's best ever performances under this manager. Of course, if he scores that chance, no one's even which looking. One? At, yeah, well, you know, the, the, the one with Salah. Salah plays the ball of the oh, season, by the way. Oh, I mean, that's I think that's one of the reasons why it's so painful. <laughs> yeah, and the touch is unbelievable as well, isn't it? The yeah, he does everything right. Yeah. He does everything right, and he opens his body out. It was oh. the right thing to do because if he if he just whacked it into the keeper, he should have opened his body out. So he think, so he opens his body out in the heat of battle, and he just can't get his foot around it enough. It's just unlucky. I, I was listening to you and Ben on the post match, and Ben was. I can understand the frustration. He's just not a killer. I think I think that's harsh. I mean, I've seen Sadio. And, and Mo missed some big chances in big games. They're easily forgotten if you then score another one. Luis Diaz has got, what, 11 goals, 12 goals this season already. 
He absolutely he gives them so many headaches. I'd love to see what they were saying about him in the city dressing room afterwards because it's not just that cameo late on where he drags Rodri and Walker all over the place. He's doing that throughout the games, and and he did that to Chelsea by the way for all the plaudits the the young boys got. What he did in that league cup final, he final. was he was unreal. Yeah, his, his energy levels are frightening. I, I wonder. I came out of that thinking. Is he our fittest player? Because he's had seen so much of the ball, he's covered so much distance up and down that 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 uh, flank. How's he still doing that at this minute of the game? I, anyway, that's my opinion on him. He should have scored, but boy, I thought he was fantastic. Yeah, he was. He was. He was. It, it was really difficult to sort of do match ratings and stuff like that because you think, well, really, Liverpool. He's the reason Liverpool didn't win the game in terms of those moments, but. But the sprint to get he to was, that yeah, position yeah, as well. And, and Nobody else did it. I can also see why he, maybe he's knackered when he gets into the penalty area. He does that yeah. much. He carries the ball that far. I think American football wise, the, the, the yardage he must make up in a game must be must be huge, mustn't he? You know. Yeah. I think I think he had a really poor spell early in the season. I, I had a lot of doubts about him in terms of that explosiveness. I felt I actually think he became easy to play against for a fullback. But I think since possibly since he came off the bench on Boxing Day, I think it was Burnley, wasn't it? And yeah. Set up a goal. And then he was, since then, I think he's been another one that's really sort of answered a few critics, maybe got his legs back under him, just just got a bit of a bit of form and consistency about him. And Canate is another one um, who just seemed to have stepped it up since since Christmas. He was he was top class Diaz yesterday. I thought I thought Nunes was top class second half. I had an absolute nightmare in the first half. He was I saw Barney Roney described him as like an unruly Labrador knocking over furniture and just you know getting into you know annoying people. That was a decent way of putting it. Five offsides, wasn't it, in the in the in, a, in the first half. But I thought him and him and Diaz really in the second half they they did what we wanted them to do in the in the game and sort of make City feel feel that they're, uh, they're under pressure feel so vulnerable yeah. made, both of them made them feel so vulnerable and I think that the, the Diaz frustration but the good thing is and it's good to go back to the New Year's point from earlier in the season Rob yeah. just keep getting the chances mate and I'm yeah, more relaxed I'm, exactly. I'm relaxed about the just keep getting the chances Definitely. thing I think I, I understand Ben's killer points my points yeah, I is, too. but I think but also in your head you're putting them up against the theoretical version of Jota and I think yeah, if you put yeah. all of Liverpool's forwards up, and I and I go to Manny and Firmino to be honest yeah, with you as well, up against a, yeah. a theoretical version of Jota, you're like, yeah, but I've that's s- Jota. I've seen Manny miss almost that exact chance that Diaz missed yeah. when he went clean through. Do you remember the Leicester one? He yeah, missed. there's one at Everton. Was it was it Everton where he, he's clean through in the in, in the one that he draw one one? He's in on his yeah. left foot, and you think the one at Roma where they end up winning five two, he's clean through, and you know I, it's easy to say, oh, X Manny score scores that, or Firmino scores that, or Jota. I think I think Diaz. Needs to get his eye back in in terms of his shoot. He's he's still arriving in the box quite nicely. If you look at his goals, he scores a hell of a lot of nice scruffy goals for you between the sticks. The goals he scored two last season against Napoli in that horrible defeat and against Palace, I think yeah, early cutting on. In, cutting in, cutting yeah, in. now those are classic Diaz goals. And if you look at his show reels from his times at Porto, he did that a lot. Do you know, like eight or nine of them in a season for Liverpool? It reminds me a bit of Coutinho. Do you remember there was a phase where he was doing everything right, but in front of goal, you'd just see him pull his shot, wouldn't you? And you go, oh. sometimes they go in, but just he'd pull it just that little bit and it wouldn't happen. And then he hit that, that vein of form, I think in his last year for Liverpool, part, partly under Klopp, where, no, totally under Klopp, where he stu- he got, his eye was in, he was, able to, he was able to sort of have a better measure of the goal, uh, be able to choose different sides, diff- different posts better. And I think that'll cut... I do, I'd like Diaz to be a couple of years younger, if I'm not honest. He's quietly times t- t- ticking by, I think he's 27. <laughs> and he goes, if he's 24, I'm going to go, I'll tell you on a year's time, you just watch what he's going to become. Think, I think he may well, I yeah, have a no I think he's capable, call. isn't he? I, I think... What's definitely happened this season with him is he's getting into better positions in the box. I, I, yeah. thought, I always thought Diaz, even when he first came, he was too far away from goal too often. Where, like, yeah. Really, really great dribble, but he, <clears throat> when he's finished the dribble, he's 25 yards out and he's having a shot. At least now you're seeing him. He's in the penalty area quite a lot, isn't he? Gets a lot of, um, like yeah. you say, scruffy goals. Just get, get, the, get the opportunities, keep creating the chances. You never know if they're going to come. Um, I thought Robertson was excellent when he came on in. I thought he really offered something different. I thought it was the perfect way to be, for an experienced player to be a substitute in a game like that. He, he decided, I've got, th- I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing ninety minutes running near in thirty, and I thought he, I thought he really helped Liverpool grab the game by the scruff of the neck. Yeah, totally agree. I think again, he's probably one of those where the manager might have to and fro on it a little bit because I think he does provide. Unbelievable intensity, Robbo. And he's, I think it's his birthday today. He's just turned 30. But right. he's probably had a, I know, yeah, he's probably, <laughs> he's probably had a little bit of unfair criticism over recent months. Obviously, he's had the injury. And I think you've seen in games 
against Forest probably in midweek as well, where he may be struggling to kind of get back to his level. But he was out for a while. But even before that, I felt there was maybe one or two unfair shouts his way. He's been brilliant for this football club. He's been absolutely superb. And a fit and fire and Andy Robertson, he starts in that match all day, every day because of what he what he brings. You're not only in terms of quality, and you see it for the for the Nunes chance, and Nunes has hard lines, the goalie does really well, but in terms of his leadership skills as well, he's someone who's, you know, he never shies away from a challenge. I think there's been one of times where when he's finding his way back to fitness, you can see he's trying to get there, he's trying to press, and he's just arriving too late, and people are spinning in behind him, and it doesn't look particularly great, and you can see why people are maybe having a little bit of a pop but let's not forget about he, how good he's been over the years. He makes the pitch massive him and Salah. Yeah. From that minute that sub comes on, I, Liverpool are in the ascendancy anyway. Liverpool have been the better side since the break. But all of a sudden, if you're City and the way City want to play in this sort of compact way where sometimes Stones moves into midfield, but that then leaves them with only three. Suddenly they can't defend with only three because Robertson's capable of making the pitch enormous. That gives Diaz more mm. room to then play into. And Salah hugs the touchline on the other side uh, as a starting position, Ian, and obviously wants to arrive as he goes. And I just think that from that point... City have almost just got too much pitch to worry about yeah. and I think that that is it's part of the tactical decisions but it's also the excellence of those players but with Robertson Salah at least gets to have a starting position with Robertson he's got to cover the ground over yeah. and over again to, to demonstrate that but he's more than capable of doing that and you know I think Joe Gomez did struggle first half shift him to right hand side he was fine I thought Gomez played well second half but you always talk about this Neil Robertson is he's faster than you think and it, all of a sudden, Liverpool have got a threat up and down that left-hand side. And he is capable of kind of going in behind. And maybe if you're going to kind of throw any shaders where you might say now and again he could finish a little bit better. I think that's fair. You know, there's, there's times when he gets into some really good positions and he, you never quite fancy him in front of goal. But in terms of that creative spark and that thrust and that drive, he's everything you want from a full-back. And he's been, as I said before, he's been, he's been brilliant again. Talk about kind of all-time great left-backs in the Premier League. He's in the conversation. You know, people might go towards Ashley Cole. They understand why, because he has been a, a great a great full-back. But in terms of assist numbers, Robertson kills him in terms of assist numbers. He's such a smart footballer, Andy Robbo. And as I say, I think sometimes what he offers gets downplayed a little bit because of how, he, how he's seen and stuff. And maybe he's not the, the fanciest or the silkiest of players. But he's been absolutely pivotal to Liverpool's success under Jurgen Klopp. And as I say, I thought he was excellent when he came on yesterday. Last one I want to talk about uh, is Elliot, Neil. Yeah. Where it's an, I, don't, I don't want to just be in the context of the previous performances, but they are in the back of your mind and that he's been absolutely flogged. He's played yeah. and played. And we've gone from saying Harvey Elliott could do get more opportunities <laughs> to people wondering whether or not they get, need to get in touch with social services. <laughs> uh, that's the speed with which this has turned around. Yeah. Uh, but he has repeatedly just stood up and stood up. And yesterday is another great example of, of Harvey Elliott standing up being counted touch being right brain being right focus being right and working so hard yeah. and and to go to the point that we made about I mean, he's younger than Quanta yep well younger than Kelleher you and know. Bradley yeah and is he? I yeah. think he's not much older than Bobby Clark and, and, and the others you know 21 next month he's, he's moved this this is the season he's moved into but Harvey Elliott plays for Liverpool Harvey, you know, Harvey Elliott isn't just like, oh, he's on the fringes of the Liverpool team. He's a good player, you know, might 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 be one for the future. He plays for Liverpool, like, yep, in in two different positions, more often than not as well. And I think I thought he was really good second half on on Thursday when Sobislay came on, and obviously when Salah came on because he he encourages people to play football. You know, he doesn't yes. he, like there are some where. Diaz is a little bit like that on the other side where it's almost people get away from him give, you know like you need to give him the space and let him sort of have a run with Elliot he, he draws people to him and, and it, you get the one twos but you also he's also added definitely added that switch where it's like right you drag people over and right it's going out the other side he, he's he's very reliable in his touch in, in terms of you know you never ever feel like he's going to sort of He's got a panic in a, in a situation. You might think he might have a physical limitation, or he might not be quite quick enough. But you'd never think, oh, he's gonna get caught doing something silly. Um, and I think the fitness this season has just gone up, gone through the roof. And you've seen it in the recent weeks. You know the fact that he was he was Liverpool's, he was the one really carrying the fight in the extra time periods of the cup final. You saw him obviously going through the. Um, the Luton game, he ends up scoring in the last minute of, the, of yep. that game. Southampton, he, st- he sets up the third goal. Uh, he's just, he's just really stepped up a level. I, I thought it in the summer when when I saw him, he, he went away. Had a really good summer with England, twenty um, ones. Saw him in the summer and thought, oh, he's, he looks like he's just added a little extra oomph to his game. You know, you're allowed to do that at twenty, aren't you? In twenty one, and I think I, I, 
I don't understand if there's anyone now who doubts Harvey Elliott as a, as a Liverpool player. I think he, I think he's not just a Liverpool player, but a very important one as well. He, I think thus far he's been a sort of player where. He's also had to sort of sacrifice the best of himself for the team. He's been asked to do jobs, hasn't he? Change position? Yeah, change pos- change position. Just it, almost like he's a holding action, at, at every and every challenge he rises to. I'm I'm going to be fascinated with how his career is going to develop as he as he reaches you know the ages or like Foden. What's Foden now? Twenty four ish. Twenty five, I think. Twenty five ish. So yeah. you know, I, I, Elliot feels to me like Foden was three years ago, where you go, they've got a good little player on that. I wonder how far he could go, and then bit by bit you realise, and obviously he doesn't have Foden's pace. I'm not saying they're the same player, but he reminds me more of Bernardo Silva. But I'm, yeah. I, I think I think another manager in a year or two's time, might go, this, this lad's so good, he has to be our number 10. He has to, everything has to go through him. So instead of being a placeholder or, or, or a filler-inner, a team may begin to build around his intelligence and technique, uh, you know, an application and professionalism. I might be wrong, but I, I think the sky's the limit for him still. Always wants to take it in any kind of, yeah. in any game situation, under any circumstances. There's a couple of things yesterday where he loses the ball for the Haaland chance, Elliot, and he loses the ball for the docu chance as well. Well, he gives it, he gives Diaz a bad pass, and it, it gets kind of, uh, it gets pinched. But he'll take it all the time. And again, it's back to this bravery piece that we spoke about before. He's so brave. And Rob, you talk about kind of changing position. He's doing that in game. Yeah, yeah, no. all the time. Mm. He's doing that in game. The manager trusts him, kind of to the point where he'll put him almost anywhere. And you know, back to the age points, twenty years of age, and he's almost been. This player where, because he's been so good off the bench, people have now said, well, he's an impact player and that's what he is. But I think you've seen enough over recent weeks to know, actually, there's a lot more to him than that. And maybe maybe there's one or two goals or one or two things where you'd say maybe he could get more goals. That might, that might come. But because he was obviously playing in the league at such a young age, you do forget just how young he is. You do forget he's only 20 years of age. And some of those lads you've mentioned there, Neil, in terms of comparisons, I think people on the outside would think Harvey Elliott's a lot older than he is. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the kind of impact he's made over recent weeks when he's had to go to the well time and time again, play the 90s, play the 120s in the cup final. He's been brilliant. I think him and Curtis are a good good example to anyone that you've got to, you've got to marry all, the, all of the talent and the precocious sort of ability, but you've got to learn to play play football, how to play football. And At I that think, level. Yeah, and both of them have, you know. I actually think probably if you drop both of those down the league... I don't think they'd be as highly rated. You know, if they went to a, a, a Bournemouth, they'd probably get more minutes. They'd be have a more central part. But I think they wouldn't. You wouldn't see the best of them because I think they thrive at that kind of that level where it's like, right, I've got to concentrate for 90, yeah. 95 minutes. And I think Curtis. You know, I've, we've talked. I've waxed lyrical about Curtis many, many times about this, but that's one of the biggest surprises that he he he's learned that so comprehensively. And I think Elliot's exactly in the same same bracket. There we are. Um... Move ourselves along and talk about the bigger picture uh, very briefly. The table and how it looks. We're not going to talk about Sparta Prague on this one. The five-one up. Uh, and no one's got a sense of what team they're going to play. Uh, um, to talk about the bigger picture first and foremost, will Pep Guardiola have the courage to play Ruben Diaz against Arsenal? Looking forward to finding that one out. Um, but he he has to play Arsenal to the next league game. It's a bit maddy, and it's twenty days. You know, there's the mm-hmm. international break. There's the cup games next weekend. Arsenal themselves don't play. Their games uh, meant to be against Chelsea, but Chelsea made the quarterfinals uh, as well. Arsenal got a game coming up midweek against Porto, and I will be wearing my classic JVC shirt with Campbell on the back for that one. <laughs> um, as I would love nothing more than Manchester City and Arsenal to draw each other in the quarters yeah. or semi-finals oh. of the Champions League, give themselves a big emotional hot house to get through with league games around it. But the table to me looks healthy. Um, it could have looked healthier if the penalty's given. It might have looked healthier, but. For me, it looks healthy because they've got to play each other. They've got to play each other. We've got Brighton at Anfield. Now, don't get me wrong, Brighton are a good side. We've got a tough record against them recently. We've got to do our bit. But that means that when they next kick off, we're top and they can't both win. Yeah, got to take care of your own business. And yeah, you're right, Brighton are a decent side, but they've been a bit funny this season. And sitting here right now, you'd absolutely back Liverpool to, to kind of take care of Brighton. At Anfield. Um, in, yeah, at Anfield in what kind of, yeah, 19, 20 days time. And for me, that's why yesterday, a draw always felt fine. And in the context of how it goes, you're a little bit kind of disheartened today, as I said earlier. But given all the adversity, given the players that were missing, no issue with a draw, no one full well, them two have got to go at each other in what, just under three weeks. And I think I'd fancy City to win, 
but I know one or two people I think maybe Arsenal have turned a bit of a corner in terms of they can go there and get a result. I'm not too sure, yeah. I think it'll be an interesting game. I certainly can't see Arsenal going there and winning, but you never know in football. It, it can always surprise you. So it was it was vital that Liverpool avoided defeat yesterday, and as I say, they're in they're in a really, really strong position, Neil. So what will it be? It'd be nine to go, won't it? Um after those fixtures and stuff and there's every chance. Would you refer to it as a big nine? <laughs> <laughs> the, the biggest of nines. Um and I What's our game after that? Is it Sheffield United? Sheffield United. United. It's Anfield. only a few Thursday, days later. Thursday, Thursday night, Sheffield United. So you, 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 who've they got that week? That midweek? I can't do everything, Rob. We have yeah. to do it. Mm. But, uh, but like City have got to go to Spurs in in April. Arsenal have got to go to Spurs and Man United. And I just I'm Brighton. I'm Brighton. I'm Brighton. And I just and I can't get, get it out Villa at home as well. I've I think. Villa are a funny it. team, aren't they? Villa yeah. can go sometimes go away from home and cause you problems. And yeah. even Palace under a new manager, I think they've got to go there quite soon as well. Yeah, I'm not just, quite sure just, what that looks and feels like. Just so. a few. I mean, I just I've been saying this so much, but I just can't see Arsenal winning it because of the fixtures. I just can't see how they're gonna stay out of trouble in 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 the last weeks of the season. And I think if you drop points, I mean, I think if they lose to City, I think that's that's curtains for them personally. But does a City don't win? A lot of those big games against the big, they, they drop, they yeah. drop point. They, they should have beat. They'll think they should have beaten Liverpool twice this season. They've drawn one one. Both they should. Have, they think we should have had them out of sight before they come back into it. They've drawn twice with Chelsea. They've drawn with Spurs. Um, oh, United. Okay, we'll, we'll talk. We lost to Arsenal. Drawn twice with Chelsea, haven't they? Drawn to yeah. four four and one one. Yeah. yeah, like so they. they Lost to Arsenal. They, they yeah. haven't yet. They've probably got as much to prove as Arsenal in terms of this big game. We're saying, oh, can Arsenal go there and win? It's like actually, can City put to bed one of the one of the, the top four? You know, can they make their dominance count in in, in a game like that? Lost to so, Villa. Lost to Villa. Yeah, yeah, of course. So there's there's a lot of. Um, I was thinking about this. And I, I also think there might be Arsenal are so emotional that it could be an absolute war. You know, one of those games where it becomes like a real sort of niggly game that annoys people and you get an injury or you get a red card or you get those kind of things or you get that, like Neil says, that emotional kind of, we got the win, but tell you what, that took it out of us, you know, and then the next game you face, you've got Wolves or something like that and you think, that well, might be a difficult one now. I, I, I feel as long as we take care of business yeah. and the nearer it gets to that Brighton game, I'm going to be shitting myself because I think that is the definitive... game in our history. Yes, that is the definitive mm-hmm. banana skin. People will go, oh, chef, you at home, that's a banana skin. No, it fucking isn't. It'll just be a freak result if they get anything. But Brighton is a, Brighton's a banana skin. Not that we can't now, uh, get past it. But I was thinking about that, that City-Arsenal little game. There is, I know it's, maybe it's a cliche and obvious, but there is no bad outcome really for us because any, any way you riddle it, so City, City, I think City's, City winning's the worst. I think personally. Well, City lose, we could put four points yeah, between us. Yeah. I mean, that, in a way, when I say I that, still, out loud, I still think I they're, want, the, they're the ones. They're the ones you want to you want to put on City the ground. Yeah. You want that to happen. Draw all day. Mm. We're all um, so City win. Well, still, still, I was still in Liverpool. It hands, sort of it? knocks Arsenal out, semi knocks Arsenal out. <laughs> mm. It's only two points if, if we win and they and Arsenal get beat. It's only two points. It's worth saying. Um, no, it's no, three, three points. Three points. Yeah. Three but points. the game, they get goal differences. The goal difference. The goal, the goal, I think the goal difference can turn itself around relatively. Mm. Well, we've got Sheffield United. <laughs> I think we've got Sheffield United. So I know everyone's looking at that, but it is it is an opportunity. It'll, It'll be one nil. So uh, one nil. Yeah, late Sheffield penalty. United. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now. But the play, you've got the players as well. That's the other the other part. Well, that's isn't it. That's the time. Time is our friend at the minute. And this is part of the reason why I wanted to get through against Southampton was because times are mate kicks that Everton game into a midweek that Everton yeah, yeah. won't want but also literally buys us some so, more time before another league game Curtis Trent maybe Allison obviously Salah will, is not going away with, with Egypt which is another so bonus like, so got some like Robertson you know fitness can it, it can look very different can't yeah. it mm-hmm. Liverpool, Liverpool sort of squad and bench and you know that that could be the difference maker in the, in the closing weeks of the season it's an international break to play our joker, I'm saying. Uh, the manager's never really done that sort of thing. But you know what? He's, 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 he's having a big rest for a while. Uh, so he should fill his boots before the next one. I like the fact that we got the Egyptian sports ministry involved, uh, where Mo Salah's concerned. We've got to take this to the top uh, if we're going to do what we need to do, which is get Liverpool back on top. They are on top. They're level on points with Arsenal. I do not care about your goal difference. Uh, Liverpool are on the march. Thank you very much to Neil Jones, to Ian Ryan, to Rob Gutman, Andy Heaton for producing the sounds. Jordan Singleton for doing the images it's been an absolute pleasure uh, just as yesterday's game was it was the business to be in Anfield it should always be like that